Good afternoon. The clergy and members of St. Hilda's Anglican Church welcome you all to our noonday bite and sip devotion, which take place every Tuesday and Thursday. Joining me is Father David Hoops. act of thanksgiving. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. And the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Your law, O God, is perfect, reviving our souls. And your commandments are sure, rejoicing our hearts. Let our words and worship, the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Let us pray. O wise God, you have come to us in the form of a vulnerable child. You teach us that the last are first and the first last. You lead us on a way to new life that leads to death. Truly, your wisdom is different. <clears throat> Meet us in the place and teach us your foolish wisdom and your vulnerable power. Give us joy to receive it fully and courage to live it foolishly. Through Jesus Christ, your wisdom and word. Amen. Let us pray. God, you heap your love upon us like a parent providing for a family's needs, embracing a child with tenderness. Forgive us when, like spoiled children, we treat your generosity as our right or hug it possessively to ourselves. Give us enough trust to live secure in your love and to share it freely with others in open-handed confidence that your grace will never run out. Amen. 
Scripture reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone with who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. It is easier, Jesus said, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and feels with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The dialogue between Jesus and the rich young man is often used in time of religious professions, the professions of monks and nuns. It is also incorporated in the rules of religious orders regarding the vow of poverty. In the church, especially in the Anglican church, there are not many who are called to the monastic life. And this is good in two ways. The small number of monks and nuns can be a catalyst for, of the larger, for the larger number of church members, a catalyst that encourages commitment, self-sacrifice, and availability for corporal works of mercy and for prayer. It's also good because society needs the continuation of the human species. We need a family and we need a stable economy to keep life going. This is very apparent in this time of COVID-19 pandemic. So we need the complementary services of monks and nuns with the larger church, for together we advance Christ's work of love. But how does the encounter of Jesus with the rich young man affect your life and the lives of your family, friends, even members of St. Hilda's Parish? I believe, first of all, the story reminds us of our commitment to the task of Christ's work. We begin this by realizing our own vocation, or what is the right direction of our own lives, be it that of parenthood, business, art, 
education, medicine, technology, sports, or ordained ministry. Doing our work, whatever that work is, with integrity, giving our best, being honest, being gracious with colleagues. Remember the trust which is given to us and the trust that you and I have accepted in our work. For example, what about the marriage vow? What about our ordination vows? What about the vows taken in leadership? Many of us are entirely disappointed with what is going on south of the border with the Senate of the United States. And one wonders, are the senators really remembering the solemn oaths they took in this very fraught time? Next Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, is the beginning of the solemn season of Lent, a time for reflection, revelation of our own behaviors, asking for forgiveness and restoration. That is the real purpose of the Lenten discipline. It's not just to make us feel miserable or to invo invoke a kind of extreme piety, but it's a time of honest evaluation of our lives. Why did the young man leave Jesus sorrowful? I think perhaps in his heart, he too wanted to be one of the disciples, one of the 12. But what stopped him? his possessions. He just could not bring himself to give up his possessions and his status. And so he went away sorrowful. Well, how do you and I deal with these things? How do we deal with our own possessions, our own resources, our own status? Some people hoard. And psychologists tells us that this is a substitute for personal relationships. And it's, it's a really dreadful kind of thing. Perhaps you've watched some of those programs on television about hoarders, rather dreadful. Other people desire more than what is really needed, never content with what they have, always wanting more. And this becomes the thing which drives their life and their activities. And perhaps and some people value prestige over integrity. So the reflection for each of us is you and I need to ask ourselves, what do I value most in life? What is our relationship with God? What place does God have in our decision making? What counts? I would guess that all of the residents in St. Hilda's Towers and at the Gardensworthy building have done a considerable amount of downsizing from their homes when they moved here. And if you've ever had to do that, it's a daunting task because over the years we collect many things. Some things we very much value that they are family treasures and so on. But we realize when we're going to a smaller place that there's only so much room and we have to make the decision, what do we really treasure? In one of my parishes in Long Island, New York, uh, and I've told this before, but we had a fire. It was due to arson and the church building was very badly damaged. And I remember the day of the fire, many people were telephoning me and said, oh, we're so sorry you've lost your church. And I said, no, the church is quite sound. I said, the building is damaged, but the church is, is sound. And I said, we're, uh, this was on a Friday. And I said, what we're doing, I said, as soon as I hang up this telephone, a group of us are going to the parish house and we're going to scrub everything down because Friday night is the night that we have the AA meetings. And we feel that that's a ministry that we want to keep up. And so we did. And on Sunday, we had church services in the parish house. The work of the church went on. And we realized as much as we treasured our beautiful church building, and we did rebuild it, uh, we realized that the most important thing was the people of God working and worshiping together for God and with God. Well, 
again, we say what really counts in life. Sad to say, in many families, there have been great divisions over things. The reading of a will, when people felt that they were left out and had enmity with their sisters and brothers and relatives over things. It's very sad these things happen. What about Jesus' response to Peter? After Jesus recounted this incident and he talked about, you know, the danger of wealth and our our uh, desire for it and our concern about it. Uh, Peter says, but Lord, we've left all and followed you. Uh, is there a place for us in God's kingdom? Are we doing enough? And Jesus answered, there's no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father and children or lands for my sake and for that of the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time house and brother and sister and mothers and fathers, children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many that are first will be last and the last first. I can give a witness from my own life. My family were not pleased when I when I recounted that I really felt God was calling me to be part of the monastic life. And they had all kinds of great fears that I was going to be living in some terrible kind of condition and that I would be rejecting my family and they would never see me and all these kind of things. I said, well, that isn't true at all. And I said, well, what have I gained from this? First of all, I'm doing the kind of ministry that I believe God wants me to do but just for the physical things, I said, well, I feel very rich. I have a very nice house in Toronto. Uh, the order has a very nice house in New York City. Uh, we have one in California. We have one in South Africa. So I said, I have all these wonderful houses. And I said, even though I'm an only child, I have so many monastic sisters and brothers and I've been in parochial work for 44 years. And over the years, I have made so many friends that are still part of my family. So I said, you know, I do not feel at all alone. I don't feel at all uh, denied anything. And I think about two major people who uh, really gave up things for the gospel. One St. Francis of Assisi. Did Francis ever discern that his small movement in Italy would become worldwide and would continue for over a thousand years? Did Mother Teresa of Calcutta ever envision that her work in Calcutta with the outcasts would also become a worldwide ministry? Did the 12 disciples ever discern that they would still be remembered over 2000 years later? If you've ever gone to a school reunion, especially a significant one, maybe your 40th year or 50th or whatever, it's interesting to look at your fellow students. And we all can remember our time at school where they were always the stars of the school. You know, the outstanding athletes, the most attractive people, the, the most eloquent people, the ones who had the best business sense, and sometimes we felt that we were really the lesser lights and we kind of, you know, we were not quite uh, the stars and so on. And so we look around and we talk to our colleagues and we see many of them are now very pathetic. And we also see some that seem to be the quiet people, the quote shy violets have absolutely blossomed and are doing well. So I often think of Jesus's words, the first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus is saying to you and me, I have called you to be my disciple. Some of you I've called to be intimate. Some of you I have called not to be quite as intense as the 12, but I've called each of you to share the gospel. And I'm giving you all the resources you need. You needn't worry about it. They will be there. And the work of love, the work of the gospel will continue. And the wonderful thing is God will continue to inspire 
you and me and those who are to come to carry on his great work of love. And so we say, thanks be to God, and may we do our part. Amen. We approach intercession. Let us pray. Sometimes the troubles of the world seem impossible to address and the burdens of our lives seem too much for us to bear. Yet, we trust that for God, all things are possible. God alone can save us. Therefore, we are bold to pray saying, God of mercy, be gracious to us. Be gracious to us. We pray for peace among the nations, food for the hungry, justice for the poor, and a life of dignity for all people. God of mercy, be gracious to us. We pray for new life in the church, fresh energy in mission, faithfulness in ministry, and reconciliation in the body of Christ. God of mercy. Be gracious to us. We pray for the welfare of this community, safe streets and homes, good schools and jobs, and the spirit of love among neighbors. God of mercy, be gracious to us. We pray for the healing of all who suffer, comfort for the afflicted, hope for the despairing, and strength for those who care for them. God of mercy, be gracious to us. O oh God, in whom all things are possible, we commend these prayers to you and commit our lives to seek your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. A form of the Lord's Prayer. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God, in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name, echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and call on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb, for, for another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. For, from trials too great to endure, bear us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. May God, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, strengthen you day by day, and the blessing of the fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you today and evermore. Amen. So now it's Mr. Share, as Marcia has already said, that every Tuesday and Thursday at 12 noon, Bite and Sip is shared, and you find this on our Facebook page, which is St. Hilda's Fairbank Anglican Church. February 14, 1030 a.m. is the last Sunday after the Epiphany, and in the secular world, it's also Valentine's Day. The service will be live streamed on the website, which you can find at www.sthildasanglicanchurch.com and on YouTube. 
Following the service at noon is the Sunday school program known as Kids for Jesus. This is online. And again, you'll find this on our website, YouTube, and Facebook page. February the 7th, 17th, Ash Wednesday, at 10.30 in the morning for the Towers residence, uh, there will be a service. Uh, only eight persons may attend and must register. In the evening at 7.30, the liturgy will be live streamed. The following Sunday, February 21st at 1 p.m. is the annual vestry meeting that will be done on Zoom. And on the last Sunday of February, February 28th at 4.30 p.m. is the annual Black History Service. Music begins at 4.15. Again, this will be um, on Zoom and live streamed. We give thanks for the music which has blessed our service today. Give thanks for Martin de Groot and for the assistance of the Reverend Catherine Matthews Huey, the Reverend Susan A. Blaine, uh, from the series Feasting on the Word by Jan Barry, and from the resources of the Anglican Church of New Zealand. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be safe, be blessed, and be a blessing. Take my life and let it be Oh.